And this is kind of an unusual message, but uh, it's something the Lord has uh, uh, kind of brought me through and gave me uh, some questions came to my mind, so I'm going to try to answer those with what I believe is, is, uh, is uh, the right answer. But uh, uh, Mark chapter 14, verse number 10, the Bible said, And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went of the chief priests to betray him unto them. And, uh, when they, uh, the, and when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him, that is, Jesus. Uh, Heavenly Fathers, we, we bound thy presence. We need your help today, uh, Lord, and, and understanding and wisdom. And uh, we pray, God, you'd help us to um, rightly divide the word of truth. And thank you for what you're going to do. We pray, Lord, for everyone here today, everyone listening today, uh, that folks would get help, that people who are unsaved would do the most important thing in their life, and that's repent of their sins, trust the blood, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross and his resurrection on the third day. Trust him as their Savior and be saved forever. I pray, God, that you would move on our hearts, we that are saved, that we might learn how to relate to people, even difficult people. And God will thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Judas uh, is an interesting character in the Bible. Judas was uh, someone whose, whose name uh, meant, uh, he's an enigma <laughs> in his seemingly dedication to the Lord and then betrayal of the Lord. Uh, what we know about Judas by his name, that he came from a, a probably a very good home, a very um, humble town about, um, I think it was 20, 20 some miles from Jerusalem. His name in, indicates uh, once a very proud name, you wouldn't think that, Judas, a very proud name in Jewish history. I don't think I've ever met anybody named Judas, but that would be a good name for a kid. <laughs> the original. Uh, can you imagine that being called? They still do that in elementary school, call out the roll call. Judas, present or not, you don't know. So, so he came from a good home. Uh, Judah or Judas was the name of one of the 12 sons of Jacob who headed up the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing when you look at the life at, uh, of Judas. And, by, uh, and, and I want to try to uh, apply some <laughs> basic psychology. I've had, in all honesty, I've, I've had the psychology of counseling when I was in Bible college, and I've read some uh, things uh, and by necessity and dealing with folks and, and learned some things I did not know, and I've talked to some uh, folks that do that professionally that gave me some kind of pointers. Uh, the main thing I know is when something is, is over my head, I know how to refer people, and I have several uh, folks that I can refer people to that need specific help. And so I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to uh, uh, pretend to be a psychologist because I'm not. And the things I'm going to talk about, I have uh, kind of, uh, I'm reading a book uh, that really intrigued some, uh, intrigued some thought to me and really gave me the basis for this message. And then uh, I've, I've kind of verified some things, looked up some things online that are pretty, pretty uh, basic across the board. So I'm not going to go beyond that. But let's look at Judas, and then I want to talk about what I believe uh, Judas's problem was. Uh, he, he had no obvious vices like the other, some of the other disciples who, uh, like Peter, who was impetuous and, and would say things, and uh, he couldn't uh, 
perform and uh, would say things out of anger. And some of the disciples, which were tax collectors, they would, uh, you know, they, they really were the betrayers. They were the, considered the Judas. Uh, they betrayed their country by helping collect the taxes. And, and uh, he didn't have any known weaknesses. From, from the standpoint of how you would look at Judas, how the disciples looked at Judas, which is an amazing thing, uh, Judas was a man of, of promise. He was called to follow Christ. He was called to be an apostle. apostle. He was one who, uh, where the foundation of the church was going to, his work rather, was going to rest. He was an admired person. He was a person that, uh, and this is fascinating to me, and this kind of really led to the line of thought that I'm going to get to in just a moment. Judas was trusted equal to or maybe even beyond the disciples. We saw and we have the insight of, 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 of knowing what God knew about Judas. We know that Judas was a thief. He kept the, the treasury. And uh, somebody said, I'm trying to find that stat here, but they said people that are, are uh, in banking say that uh, over half, 60-some percent of people that handle money take money. So that's why we've got um, safeguards. Art sitting by. Boy, you look guilty right now. <laughs> but we, we have safeguards in place uh, not because we don't trust people handling the money here, but we, we, we're looking toward the future, and, and they need to be kept in place where people are accountable to other people. So that's a whole other story. I could tell you some stories of things that have, that have happened in, in, uh, <laughs> in this church, even. <laughs> but not, not with art. Thank God for that. But uh, So we look, we look at... Um, the life of Judas. He was a trusted man. Remember when um, Jesus said in the upper room, one of you will betray me. They had been, he had sat at the feet of Jesus. Now understand this about him. And I want to draw a, a kind of a, a, a distinction between Judas and other people, normal people, if there is such a thing, that rejected Christ. But Judas was one that was so deceptive, so manipulative, such a con man. I preached one time on Judas the con man, but then I've got a little bit deeper into what a con person is, and we've dealt with con people before uh, here at the church and, and uh, uh, in the past. So Judas, Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, and they said, they're with him day and night. Do you understand this? He's one of the brethren. He is one that you, you would go to when you're having a problem and say, Brother, my faith is weak. I need you. Would you pray for me? Oh, yeah, I'll pray for you. Hey, I'm being tempted in an area. Hey, can you, can you help me? And he would say, yeah, he might have been the go-to guy. He was trusted with the money. He was uh, looked up to. And, and Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. And they said, Lord, is it Judas? No, they didn't say that. They said, Lord, is it I? I trust Judas more than I trust myself. Are you with me? This guy was, he's something else. And so we look at what could have led to his, uh, to his uh, attitude. Well, part of it could have been uh, jealousy. He was embittered because um, the Galileans were brought to a higher place of authority than he was, and maybe he looked at the little farming town that he was from, kind of insignificant. Maybe Jesus favored them above him. Uh, greed was, could have been a contributing uh, factor to uh, Judas's motive. See, the Lord's listening to the mind of Judas. He knows everything he's thinking, everything he's doing. We need to understand this. These are two things we need to get. Judas was never saved. 
This is really important, and this is the heart of the message. Judas could have been saved. So, it could have been that uh, jealousy, his di dissatisfaction when he realized that Jesus was not going to set up his earthly kingdom. I think that's the heart of it. He's hearing the Lord. Remember, there's two aspects of the Lord. He's coming as a lamb, Bible, the prophecy says. Then he's coming as a lion out of the tribe of Judah. So they were looking for the lion. They thought he was going to come and set up a kingdom, and he was going to run out Rome, they were going to get their country back. And that's kind of a natural assumption. That's something that we would have probably hoped or thought. And basically, I believe all the disciples start that, uh, thought that initially until they begin to understand the teaching of Jesus. So Judas was dissatisfied. He was disappointed in the direction of Jesus' ministry. He believed in and saw the miracles. If this man can resurrect bodies, if this man can heal leprosy, if this man can cast out devils, surely he can call the Roman, uh, cause the Roman soldiers to die. He's got power over life. He believed in that. He wanted to use that. So uh, he, he understood it. And Jews, Judas did, we need to get this, Judas was given a power and authority he did everything the disciples did. When they went out and preached, now listen to me, Judas preached and people got saved. I had uh, uh, a man I knew years ago that, that uh, he wasn't saved, he was in college, and he, I don't know where he thought he was saved or whether he just liked the idea of it. I think the way he presented it, he just liked the idea of it. Of Christianity, he wanted to try it out, and he witnessed, and people got saved. The word of God works if Judas uses it. It works. So let me get on with this. So we we, we see that there were possible reasons that Judas did betray the Lord. Uh, we look at his life. We see sin is progressive. We see that sin. It starts here. We talked about reaping and sowing another day. Then it gets a little worse and a little worse and a little worse. And sin deceives. And sin, and this is really important, sin wastes our lives. We don't want to waste our lives. We don't want to waste our time following that which is not true and not real. He betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, and that was just, that was a lot of money, but he could have got a lot more money just hanging with Jesus. That was the 30 pieces of silver was just, yeah, whatever, I'll take that. And that was prophesied in Psalm 41.9, Psalm 109.5, and Zechariah 11 and 12. God foretold that he would be betrayed, how he would be betrayed. We look, we look at his life, and we see a man that had some issues. Now, I, I've been brought to a, uh, in dealing with people uh, of all, you know, of all types of people, I've been brought to a position of, <laughs> of reading a book uh, that somebody recommended. It's a really interesting book entitled The Sociopath Next Door. And it's fascinating. And according to what I read, and then kind of backed it up online, looked at some other what, other opinions. This is a a, a person who is uh, 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 has her credentials and has a reputation. One in twenty five people. Why are you smiling? Emily's the only one smiling. She's one of them. I've always suspected that. <laughs> Now, they've heard this. I, I kind of rehearsed this a little bit <laughs> with the burlines. We went out to eat the other day. I said, what do y'all think about this? So they said, don't preach it. So, <laughs> no, they didn't say it. So, one in 25. I was counting this morning. We got a couple in here. 
And uh, so here, here's, here's what I'm presenting this morning. And here's, the, let me get to the, the, so I don't miss this. I want you to have this in mind when I go through this stuff. I'm convinced that we, that there are people that are sociopaths or antisocial personality disorders. They, according to, now listen now, check this out, don't take my word for it, but there are people that are born without, undoubtedly, empathy or emotions or remorse or guilt. This describes Judas. I believe in depravity. I believe that all of us are incapable of saving ourselves are, and are capable of some horrendous sin uh, without the grace of God and the help of God and good, good training uh, in the home helps a whole lot toward people in a sense of right and wrong. But even at that, our sense of right and wrong as humanity is tainted by sin. And there's no substitute for the Holy Spirit living within us as believers. But let me, let me just give you what, what my belief is and why I'm, why I'm going over this today. According to psychiatrists, and a sociopath, one in 25 are sociopaths, they did studies on these, feels no empathy or emotion, remorse or guilt. They're manipulative, uh, often superior intelligence. Uh, they know what people, what makes people tick. They study people. They have great social skills, often come from strong family background. They are calculating, uh, and much of what they do, I was reading this book, and I'm like, wow, wow, wow. And if you've ever dealt with a person like this and how convincing they are, and then you begin to read this book and you're like, oh, my Lord, how could I be so stupid? <laughs> and you feel kind of dumb believing the very... Sociopaths lie better than we tell the truth. Unless I'm a sociopath. Uh, they lie better than we tell the truth. So much of what they do, you would say they can't be doing that. There would be no motivation for that. But deep in their heart is a need to divide people, a need to hurt people. They are lawbreakers, chronic liars, antisocial people, with social skills. Ouch. There are two groups of sociopaths, high-functioning, like Emily. <laughs> that means they're great at what they do. They're not functioning in society, but they are in the corporate world. They are in the religious world. And they don't care if they hurt people. They can't feel it. Uh, social predators, and they say if you fall in love with a sociopath, they find out what makes you tick. They find out what you like, and they become that. And they say it's like meeting your soulmate. They are the great pretenders. I believe Judas falls into that category. I don't think you could, if, if this is true, and, and this, these studies have been done about people, and there's all, we're all messed up. But there's a difference between being messed up and messed up. <laughs> and a person without feeling, a person who masks or pretends, it just makes sense when you look at the life of Judas and you look at what things that God um, told us not to do not to be insincere. Uh, I, one of the things in the book that um, uh, was interesting to me is a sociopath 
um, will fake injury or fake pain or fake mental disorders or fake sickness because if they acted like they were not vulnerable, everybody would be mad at them. It's hard to chew out somebody who's injured. It's hard to fuss at somebody who's wounded. And so they, they pretend to be that way. So here, here's what it brought me to. I had a curiosity of reading this book and people I've dealt with that you couldn't explain it any other way. Can a sociopath be saved? Can a sociopath be saved? Absolutely. And, and this is, again, I'm just giving you what I believe the Lord's given me and just kind of drawing out some spiritual common sense here. We know these people exist. And uh, they work mostly undercover, but the, the low-functioning ones don't cover themselves as well, so it becomes obvious over time. And it explains so much in church work. <laughs> can they be saved? And this is what I came to. Uh, can they be saved? And if they can be saved, how? Does that make sense? If, if a person can't feel love, if they can't feel guilt, and they can't feel emotions that we feel, then how in the world are they going to be saved? And Jesus had the answer and presented that answer to Judas, and, 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 the, and the thing where I believe, and you, uh, you weigh this out, if it doesn't make sense spiritually, junk it away, and I'll preach a different one tonight and next Sunday. <laughs> but I, I, I really wrestle with this thing. Here's the deal. They can be saved. How can that happen if they can't feel the emotions of love and, and be drawn to Jesus? And I think it's like this. I think it's like, Jesus said, the Bible says, some are saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire. So there's some folks that, I'm just trying to tell it like it is, guys. There are some folks that maybe they can't feel the emotion of love and responding to the love of Jesus but they've got enough intellect and law, logic to know if I, I might can deceive my way through this life. I might even be good at it. might be high functioning. And whatever degree it is of antisocial behavior, I'm sure I had some of it when I'm caught. What are you shaking your head for, Tim? I said had some of it, antisocial behavior, because I'm hanging around you all day. But... I'm sure we all have, have some of that, but this is different. So if they can't feel that, they can, ha they can have enough logic to say, I'm not stupid. I'm not going to hell. I believe there's a hell, and I believe there's a heaven, and I've got enough sense to say, maybe I can't appreciate the love of God. Now, I know I'm out on a limb here, but this is a good limb. This is a big oak limb. It's about that big. It's almost like a trunk. There are people like that in life, clearly it's documented, that do not like people, that do not like God. It explains so many people in this life that you try to reason with that you can't get through to. The fear of hell should reach, and the preaching of the whole counsel of God's word will reach people like that. Do you remember when Jesus was in a synagogue preaching and a man got saved that was demon-possessed in, in church? That, that shouldn't be. A demon-possessed man uh, uh, should not be comfortable in a synagogue should not be comfortable in the church. A person who doesn't have feeling can still be drawn to Jesus 
and still come to Jesus, I, I, I see nothing in the Bible that indicates there is a, a, a section of people who are incapable of coming to Christ. Judas could have got saved. Judas could have come to Jesus. No matter what degree of, 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 of depravity or what degree of anger at uh, humanity and indifference to people's pain and suffering, It's God's will that all come to him. It's God's will that whosoever, if they're a sociopath or if they're antisocial or whatever they are, if they're a pretender, Judas could have gotten saved because Jesus gave him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And some people are saved by the love of God. Some people are saved by fear. I was saved by not wanting to miss something. I didn't want to get left out of the rapture. It's, it's possible to be near Jesus and associated with Jesus closely and still be hardened by sin. Remember the rich young ruler? How did he go away? How did he go away? He, he rejected Jesus. Jesus said, sell all that you got and give to the poor. He said, Lord, I've kept all the commandments. And he said, how about doing this? Sell everything you got and give to the poor. Now, that wasn't to save him. That was to show him what his God was, what was in his heart. And he went away sorrowfully with remorse, with regret. Judas hanged himself, but his regret, his remorse was that he failed in his manipulation. He failed in, in infiltrating the, the group of disciples. And it's amazing how Judas, how did he portray Jesus? With a kiss. How, why that? that? That's a sign of a person with antisocial behavior. That's a sign of a person. This doesn't even bother me. How many sociopaths we have here today? Raise your hand nice and high. I see those hands all over the building. Back in the camera room. God's power is greater than man's hardness. God's power is greater than man's sin. We look at the detachment of, of Judas and how he's... He's around the people. He's seeing love manifest. And it's not moving him. It's not working. Here's the, here's the thing that kind of bugs us. Do you know that Jesus says, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in? You know that we're going to have a few antisocial sociopaths which don't care if other people live or die. They delight in hurting people. They delight in causing division among people. That's a big deal. Delight in lying. And one of the things that she mentioned in, in the book was the crocodile tears. When you get close to that person and you begin to expose the sin in their life, then they go into this emotional, fake emotional uh, performance. I used to have a Sunday school teacher that could turn tears on and off like a faucet years ago. And he would come in our Sunday school class and he'd be talking long and then you know, he'd just go into an emotional thing and then he'd stop immediately, not slowly, but immediately. I'm like, wow, that's a pretty neat trick. We have to involve our lives to reach people with the gospel. Listen, church is sacrificial. I need to get Brother Gay up here periodically. He's talking about tithing over 10%. I've never seen Brother Art talking about weeping. I've never seen Art weep tears of joy like 
just pure joy. Had his hand up. Some of you kind of kind of witnessed to that yourself. Which my wife said, man, I'm glad when they're giving 20% or more. That way we don't have to give as much. <laughs> We're going to have to hurt to help people. It is so aggravating. It is the aggravating thing in the world. And Jesus did it. And the disciples did it. And Paul talked about being in peril of what? False brethren. You're going to get used. I don't like that feeling. You get used and you want to quit the ministry. I've never wanted to do that. Being mad in the way, but ain't never wanted to get out of the way. People just won't do right. I told a preacher friend, I said, man, I tell you, the ministry would be great if it wasn't for Christians. He said the ministry would be great if Christians were Christians. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying we got we to gotta reach them. There's two things you got to do with people that are deceptive, that are manipulative, that are absolutely going to come your way. You're a, you're a sitting target. You got the love of God, and they say, oh, I'm going I'm to mess that up. There are people who will mess up your life. There are people jealous of your marriage. There are people that are jealous of your walk with God. They're jealous of everything you got in life. And some folks are out there to, to hurt, and Satan uses them. We got to help them. We got to help people. We got to help people. You, you, you got to get dirty. You got to get dirty. Me and Tim went out and, and uh, we, we, we got a heater for those guys. I think they broke that heater. I told them, go to Mercer Creek. They're getting the next one. Okay, okay. We got, we got them a heater and for the church. Our church got it for them. The guy's out in the woods. and I go out there and uh, I got a picture I took of... Uh, Jerry, who lives out there behind, the, that's his residence out there. And what's the other guy's name? I'm not sure. It's a strange name, but <laughs> two guys live out there. And we went out there and we took a picture. I said, I'm going to put this on our Facebook. And I, I, I always pick with Jerry all the time. It, it's so much fun. He's, he's got a great sense of humor. I said, Jerry, I said, you don't look homeless enough. I said, I'm trying to take this picture to put on Facebook, and I said, the other guy, his hair's messed up, so he looks homeless. I said, you look, you don't look homeless. So I turned his pocket inside out, ruffled his coat, did something. <laughs> there you go, that's the look I want. And he laughs every time I see him. <laughs> he laughs about that. He's sitting out there one day with a sign that says, I lost my wallet, need money. He ain't lost no wallet. And so I had an old wallet in the car. I, said, I hollered out and said, Jerry, I found your wallet. You don't have to beg no more. <laughs> He's shaking his head. You know what? You got to get, get dirty. You got to go out to the camp. We went out to the campsite. Been out there a couple times, pray with them. One of the guys sat down with me. We had a good talk the other day. Sat down. I went in the coffee shop and he come sat at the table. You got to get out there where people, you're going to get hurt. You're going to, you're going to get messy. You're going to get involved in people's problems. The greatest thing I know to peace is to find people that have worse problems than you got and get involved in their life. You'll come home thinking, man, I got it made. And you can help people. And every now and then, and this is important, you say, why is he preaching that? Oh, you're going to find out. <laughs> every now and then, you're going to meet a sociopath. One in 25. Made me sick when I read that. You got to do, do two things. You got to try to reach them with the gospel like Jesus did Judas. 
you got to try to reach them. Secondly, you got to protect yourself. That's why I'm preaching this. You got to see the signs and you got to protect yourself when people begin, listen, I got a, something I learned the hard way. If four or five neighbors have a problem with a person and all the police department has a problem with the person and everybody in town has a problem with the person and they're con going to convince you everybody else is wrong, it's probably not society. It's probably them. Church has to be protected. I have to, I have to, sometimes I do things, preacher, why did you do that? To keep you from getting beat up. Because I know what I'm doing. I put a lot into this. I put a lot of prayer in this. This is important to me. Protect yourself. There are some people that you got to help when it gets to the point where you can't help people, then you need to back off. But you need to get the gospel out. And we got to reach Judas. And we'll never know who Judas is, most likely. We'll never know that Judas isn't saved. Judas will be the most spiritual person we think that we know. The most outgoing person. The person that tells us everything we want to hear. And the person secretly behind everybody's back is pitting one against another just for the fun of it. That's the way it is. A person like that needs to understand. You can get by down here, but God sees right through you. You won't cry your way out of it. You won't curse your way out of it. You won't manipulate your way out of it. God cannot be manipulated. So out of just pure logic and common sense to avoid pain, your only way out is Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Maybe you can't feel the love like everybody else. Maybe you can't understand it all. But you know this. There's a way out. That's just good common sense. And his name is Jesus. And he's the only way out for any of us. And if he can't save the worst among us, can't save any of us. Thank God for the grace of God. We're a screwed up bunch of people, aren't we? Dr. Barnhouse said, I've been pastoring for years and years. I forget how many years it was. He wrote a book. He said, you know, he said, Christians are a mess. Christians. Not that we accept it, but we need Jesus. We've got to make an effort to walk with Jesus. How many's taking their medicine this week? What am I talking about? Tim, tell me what I'm talking about. And pray. That's your medicine. I know this has been a weird message, but ain't it been wonderful? As a sociopath, I'd like to say I love all of y'all. God is good. Got to deal with people. Christian life not easy all the time. You got to put yourself, you got to get hurt to help somebody. Really do. 